And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. We have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have... Coming to us all, coming to us all the way from Cardiff, we ha and the t the double-headed monster that is responsible for the creation of the upcoming Legends of Avalon. We have Darren Ozturk and Jasmine Bernhardt. How are you two doing today? Hello, I'm good. Hello, Mildred. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. <laughs> yep. um, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings. So, oh, perfect. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Um, are we talking tabletop role-playing games or role-playing games in general? Um, is is it a is it a case where is it a case where um, let's go let's go with both, <laughs> just for the, just sure. for the sake of it because of so, how interconnected it is. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. for me, when I was a kid, maybe I was ten years old my neighbor one of my best friends oh he's still my best friend actually he was the best man at my wedding mm -hmm. um he had Baldur's gate 2 on his computer and we would spend hours making characters because we didn't know how to play the game we sucked at the game but we knew how to make characters so we just make characters over and over and over again and we could never get out of the starter dungeon and he got so frustrated with it he gave it to me and then i figured it out and realized that there was a whole world out of this dungeon um that was in the uh the Forgotten Realms, I think it is. Yep. Um, and yeah, from then on, I was like, wow, role-playing games are awesome. And I didn't know it was based on a tabletop game. So I was just a kid, right? But I knew that it was rolling D20s and things like that because you could see the rules of the game. Um, so then I found about Dungeons & Dragons later on when I was growing up. But I never played it until, uh, until I finished university, believe it or not. In university, I started playing Magic the Gathering, um, but never a role-playing game. And then a friend of mine um, said, hey, I'm going to play D&D &D online. This was after university. He was a friend from university. So my first D&D &D session was online over some kind of Google channel like we're doing now um, at the age of 23, 24, I think. Um, and then we played some sessions. It was great. And then I just wanted a GM straight away. So after the third session, I made my own uh, campaign that was based on Builders Gate, the city. Um, because that's where I took my inspirations from. And then it just took off from there, I guess. Um, then I moved to Japan and met Jasmine, and we started playing together there in, in Japan. And that's that's how I started playing role-playing games. And then I started devouring all of the role-playing games that I could find, mm -hmm. and then wanted to make my own system. How about you, Jasmine? Um, I actually didn't come into contact with like the D&D &D, like, universe um, until college, but... I did grow up with JRPGs, which I know aren't exactly like role-playing games in which you assume a role, right? But it has RPG in the name for some reason. Um, I also grew up playing like journal role-play, like a live journal. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's a long history there. But in terms of like tabletop, um, my first experience with D&D was in college. Um, there was a guy in the friend group who said, Hey, I'm putting together a D&D. Why don't you come, like a D&D &D game? Why don't you come and play and check it out? And I was like, okay. And it was me and a whole bunch of our other friends. Um, but it was like him as a DM and then like eight players, which is oh, huge. Geez. It's oh. really big. That's so I, Yeah, it, it pretty much is. So I was just like sitting there and because it wasn't like the close intimate group that it really should be, I was like, I don't really know about this. I'm just kind of bored i'm just sitting here um and i think i went twice and that was it oh. um but when i went to japan um and met darren there as well and we had a smaller group this time playing um that's when i got really into it and it was so much fun um to, like tell your character stories and stuff like that mm -hmm. um yeah and um, i've been a big fan ever since yeah um as far as what you mentioned about um, JRPGs, and as a bit of an aside, I, um, 
I have some issues with that with with that particular uh, nomenclature, but yeah, <laughs> they're um, well, the, well, I the reason I I um, I might del I might delve into this later, but there is there is a reason for the whole RPG part of, part of it that um a lot of people um overlook, because um, mm -hmm. something to keep something to keep in mind is the sole reason that whole thing caught on. Is because um, wizardry had caught on more in Japan than it did in the in the states or um, in uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. and it, it had it had a fo it had a following, but wizardry always had a barrier to entry. But um, eventually, you would get Japanese knockoffs of wizardry, like the Black Onyx, and right. that provided the foundation for um, Dragon Quest because the idea was to make a simpler version of that game. For the uh, family computer, i.e., Famicom. Yeah, uh, um, Dragon Dragon Quest is like the king of all JRPGs. Well, it's the Patient Zero. Yeah. Um. But it's it was in the, but, and the ter and, from what I understand, the term JRPG isn't even used in Japan. <laughs> um, yeah. The term that I keep hearing that gets used more often is light RPG, which honestly makes more sense. Mm. Um, Do you know what they're called in Japan, Jasmine? Oh, I actually don't. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes now, when it comes to Legends of Avalon, um, yeah. Now, for, first off, it's you meant you mentioned um, you mentioned break you mentioned breaking in with Baldur's Gate and using that as an inspiration for some of your early. Um, campaigns was um, was Legends of Avalon. Was this originally like a um, like a, a campaign setting that you had used for a long time that just evolved into its own thing? No, nothing even close. No, no, I, it was made entirely. So the um, the the game itself is has origins in the, in the mechanics, mm -hmm. and then I built the world around the game. Um, uh, actually, originally the game was going to be just a generic fantasy game with no particular world lore or location. Um, and then I got some good advice from a, um, an artist, an old artist who did some art direction from some other role playing games, mm -hmm. uh, which now flip in my mind. Um, and he said, you need to pick somewhere for people to see they can imagine themselves in and you should pick something that you're familiar with. Um, and he suggested Japan because we lived in Japan. Uh, but I, I didn't want to do Japan, and then we were still we were just recently moved to Cardiff and Wales, and then I, I looked around and I saw everything's everything's medieval fantasy or Vikings, but there's no Celts anywhere, and we just lived in this place where you see Celtic language all the time, and it just kind of sparked. And a day after that meeting that I had, we decided we're going to make this a, a Celtic uh, game, but the, the game itself was already being built, and that came after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. In it's speaking of speaking of the uh, the Celt part of that, yeah. It, the um the way the way it's des the way it's described as a Cel is a Celtic Roman RPG, i.e., be i.e. being being um rooted or inspired. Yeah, by, Celtic Roman inspired. Yeah, yeah. By 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 the uh, era of the era of Celtic history when it was uh, when it was occupied by the Romans. Yeah. Um, yeah, from around 30 AD up to about 300 AD. Yeah. Um, now, put, putting aside that there's some that there's some pretty clear mysteries that can be delved into, like the um, the the whole what happened to the Ninth Legion thing. Um, <laughs> what what was the reason for going with that partic that particular approach of Celtic Roman? Right. Um, the the because. I am a fan of conflict. <laughs> I like I like uh, when there's a clash of cultures, uh, and having like some like political dynamism in the background of the the, the world mm -hmm. gives I feel like gives GMs something to latch onto if they want to. If they don't want to, then it's fine to just have it as a backdrop. You know, you can just go wandering into the other world and exploring the Celtic lands or something. But if you want to delve into some political intrigue. Then you have all of Roman politics. You have the idea of uniting the Celtic clans. Uh, you have the ideas of rebellion and uh, insurgency or political assassination. All this kind of stuff. There's just it's just meant to be 
kindling for ideas and for plots for people to latch onto if they want to or if they don't want to. So the idea of having like a clash of cultures there really um, appealed to me as like a, a storyteller and as a, as a GM in general. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Jasmine? Yeah, I think um, it, it is definitely really cool that like the Celtic clans on their own, there is plenty of conflict enough there, but having sort of like an outside influence causing the Celtic clans to make even more like uh, complicated decisions sort of adds another dimension of conflict, like you said, into the mix. So, uh, And there's one other thing as well that I, I, there's another reason as well is that I wanted this game to be particularly approachable to new players. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people don't know much about the Celts, uh, but a lot of people know about the Romans and a lot of people know about medieval fantasy and things like that in, in general. And I know Romans aren't medieval fantasy, but they have a similar culture that you're used to uh, living in like a Western or European uh, country. So you can come at the game from this kind of Roman town perspective in Britain and then discover the Celtic aspects and cultures of the world uh, as your character themselves discovers it, that you as a player discover it as well, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like a stepping off point for, for people. Um, in, in a meta sort of way as well. Yeah. Now, one of the things that really struck me when I was go when I was going through the rule summary provided on the Kickstarter mm -hmm. is the fact that Legends of Avalon is using a card based setup. Yeah. And now you you would at one would think that car that card based systems would be more frequent than they are because. Everybody knows what the standard fifty-two card deck is going to look is going to look like and how that's going to work, but yeah, it's it's one it's something that's not as frequent. What was what was the reason that you went with a um, card based system for the for this particular game? Was it inspiration from a previous game, or were there was there a different reason for using that system? It was. I can. Yeah, I can go on, go on, Yeah. Um, basically, the one of the like pillar mechanics of Avalon is edges. Um, these are sort of like wild card bonuses you get if you fail. They're sort of like, um, I would call them like symbols of progress despite failure, or if you critically succeed on a check. Mm -hmm. So if you fail something over and over again, um, the edges can be used as advantages um, for yourself. Um, to show that you've learned from your mistakes to eventually succeed, um, something like that. Um, you keep edges throughout the entirety of a scene, um, but you can also pass them around to your friends who are also making um, checks and stuff. If someone has a really difficult check coming up, all of like the people at the table can give their edges to this um, one person. Um, and we originally were playing with dice. We were playing with D6s. Um, and passing around D6s was getting kind of like, well, where did this one come from? You know, where did this, whose dice was this supposed to be and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And also um, like, we, you can't tell the difference between a dice that's been rolled or one that's not being rolled. So it as you're collecting dice. It probably sorry, doesn't help. It probably doesn't help that. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is the case at, at your tables, but in my experience, a lot of people are superstitious about, um, <laughs> about dice sharing. They, right. uh, there's the there's the mindset that um if you roll somebody else's dice it's going to be bad luck. Yeah. Oh also, yeah. You're, you'll take the dice. Different colored like dice that. things like that, and then they get confused and mixed up. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, go on, Jasmine. Sorry. Yeah. So sharing these advantages amongst each other was like really important to encouraging teamwork and stuff like that. Um. And last year, actually, we had done a play test with um some of our friends and we were using the dice, we were passing it around and the table was just covered in tiny D6s. Um, and at the end of the session, one of the players said, why don't you try playing cards instead? Um, and after she said that, Darren started putting together mechanics um, and like researching statistics for card draws and things like that. And then everything just started to slot in place after that. Yeah, everything so. just came together. And, and just the, the main thing being that you have a face down cards that represent your accruing momentum in a scene. Mm -hmm. And then when you give them to people, then obviously they turn them over and you see what they are. 
Um, so there's just, like this stored potential that you pass on to people and and like the handing the cards around just feels right and everything just fell into place. And I'm a magic player, so flipping cards for me <laughs> is just generally fun in general. And and like the heart of the cards and making a flip. So yeah, you're right. I don't know why people don't use it as much uh, in games, but once I started using cards, then I had a fear to myself, well, are people going to want to play this because it doesn't use dice? There's a lot of like resistance to using card systems that are dice. And I've had a lot of people say, well, can I use dice? And it's like, well, no, you can't. It's made, it's designed for using cards. The, 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 the way it works, you can't, you can't, I've tried to think of how to mod it to dice for the really stubborn people, but you can't do it. So no. um, it's just, it's built around cards. So yeah. There are some, there are some card, there are some card based games that in theory you could, you could use dice for, but in, pr in practice, mm -hmm. it's not advisable. And it, it can't, it's kind of like how with them, with something with something like fate you fate is meant to be rolled with um the fudge dice yeah yeah so this was it was this originally i took mm -hmm. fate as like a, as a as a base ground mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, for the for the design of the game i wanted the game to be like fate but get rid of some of the things that i weren't too keen on and that's kind of where it evolved from um, was actually from fate yeah um speaking of that what were what were some of the things that you weren't too keen on and how and how did you want to address that uh so for fate i guess the the complete genericness of fate for a start i wanted to have a set um set environment as we discussed before mm -hmm. um the other key parts were oh yeah so the, the idea of having like a um like a meta point system that allows you to evoke aspects is what they're called to gain advantages for your checks mm -hmm. that really bothered me like if 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 I have a rope that helps me climb something, it should always help me climb something, no matter what, because I have a rope. Do you see what I mean? But in Fate, you have to spend points to be able to use an aspect in a scene to help you. But if that aspect is there, it should help everyone always or hinder, depending on the situation. Uh, so that's something that really bothered me that we um, uh, changed in, in this game. Um, you know, it's so long ago now, I can't remember the other things. Uh, I'd have to read the rules again for Fate, and I'll tell you. <laughs> I mean, I, I've had my I've had my own criticisms with fate, but um, when it come now, when it comes to the when it comes to the um, car, when it comes to the card system that you're mm. that you're using, um, was that one was that one that um, when it came to the trans transition between d sixes to doing mm. this card based approach, was it an easy transition to make, or were there were there some hurdles or some things that were that worked originally didn't didn't work quite as well in this in this um present form no it got it got easier actually the way the game played and felt got easier but figuring out how to get the numbers out of cards was a bit awkward um in some places um and i in in the end we have this system where um, cards are worth different points depending on on how high value they are. Aces are worth three points. Face cards are worth two, and other cards are worth one. Mm -hmm. And then the, and then the colors of the cards matter. But that that's a bit for me as a designer slightly unsatisfying in some places because those numbers aren't on the cards. The cards already have their own numbers on them. If you see what I mean. So um, taking the like the low variation in values of between like uh three and one um and applying that to cards that was some difficulty but once i figured out oh i could use the you know and everyone knows what an ace is everyone knows what a face card is you don't have to mm -hmm. worry about being jack queen i can just a face card and everything else so once i figured that out um that was the biggest hurdle to overcome uh then everything was so much easier um and it just worked better as well uh the only other hiccup really is actually the two um one is when do you shuffle the cards because the the odds change as you play through the deck of cards Whereas dice always have the same odds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because we realized that aces are the most important cards, we just said, well, once you reveal an ace, then, then you shuffle up the cards again, and that's fine. And the other thing is that players have players are very superstitious, um, and they're not always the best at thinking about the actual odds of things. Not that they should be. They shouldn't have to worry about that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of players don't like that... Um, when you have a when you have a dice, you don't know what the value is going to be before you roll it, right? Uh, people like to blame their dice and things like that for for rolling low, but still they never know. 
But when you have a face down card in front of you and then it's been there for like a minute and you flip it and then it, it doesn't help you so much, um, then people feel like that flipping that card didn't help them. Um, when really flipping more cards is always good because you get more cards to flip and you get to pick the best ones among them. It doesn't matter where the cards came from. Uh, more cards is always better. But uh, sometimes players uh, aren't so keen on the idea that, oh, that card was always this value, but I didn't know what it was, so I should have used it for something different. But they couldn't have known that until they saw it. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that's that's an interesting player behavior that I've noticed when using cards instead of dice. Yep. Uh, can you think of any, Jasmine? I can't know. <laughs> oh, <yeah>, okay. <laughs> um, now, when I when I look at something like strain, the whole mm. the whole idea to um, to ba to basically flip over a um, fa a failure into a into a success with some consequence. Yep. Um, yeah. Was that was that some was that something that um what was was that something that was iterated into through um play, through play testing or was that always part of the plan? Um, I think it was iterated on because yeah. I remember really, really because there's no HP in a Valen, mm -hmm. um, if you've noticed, um, but there was before, and I remember mm. really early, early iterations of the game. Um, you would have like a number tracker on your side of the sheet that was like your HP or something or your energy points or something. Um, but that has changed a lot. And now it's a tired system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, uh, you know what, Jasmine's really, I completely forgot about the energy points and the health points. That was so long ago. Now. I mean, we've been working <laughs> yeah. on this game for five years almost. Uh, so it's hard to remember everything. But the um, strain mechanic was um for a few reasons one i wanted players especially new players to have some kind of control over the outcome and there are other games that do this like fate i believe there's some kind of like push mechanic there if i recall or especially in other games as well definitely but i wanted it to be completely tied within the fiction i didn't want there to be any outside forces going on here i wanted it to be tied to how your character's feeling and what they're doing so the idea of your character being tired and then you can express that in gameplay well when, when you're talking about things like, hey, should we take this risk now and do this? And it's like, well, no, my character's already tired. And you can say that because that's what it says on the character sheet. It says my character's already tired. They're strained themselves. Um, and that's, that has a mechanical reason, meaning and it has an in-game meaning as well because you now know, oh, I'm, I can take less risk because I don't have this resource available to me. And so once I decided I wanted to get rid of HP and there's, there's reasons for that related like boss fights and monsters and things like that, um, I knew that I needed some kind of system for players uh to have like a three strikes and you're out kind of thing um and once i realized i wanted like a three strikes and you're out kind of deal the uh, other two strikes are your armor and then you become wounded um i realized one of them that you could you could use it voluntarily whenever you liked mm -hmm. um and then that that gives you gives you up that resource but um and it also gives you a reason to to take breaths and things like that so once it came into play and, and we tried it out and a bunch of play tests i was super happy with it and thrilled and then we've we've kept that ever since uh, for a few years now um, and it and it plays great. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. Yeah. Um, now, when it come when it um, the vibe the vibe that I keep the vibe that I keep seeing with a lot of the with a lot of the actions when it comes to using the card system is risk reward. Mm -hmm. um, was that was that a was that a kind of battle cry that you had? Um, and I, obviously, I don't mean that literally, because <laughs> I have a hard time imagining anybody yell, anybody yelling that. Although maybe they might if they've had enough coffee. Um, <laughs> was that? But was that the? Was that kind of the um, the a core tenant that you had with how the card system was going to work? Um, not so much with. Yeah, I guess so. Like I, I wanted people. I wanted the mechanics of the game to allow because that, that so the premise of the game which i guess we haven't been over yet which i should uh, outline quickly is that you begin the game as these humble people that's why i was happy when you said let's start with your humble beginnings that's one of the calling cards mm -hmm. of the game is that you start as humble uh, townsfolk who aren't yet quite adventurers so you, you haven't done anything amazing yet you haven't learned anything amazing yet um so you you needed ways for these average people to do incredible things and the way to do that is by working together and knowing that you have these resources to fall back on so you can try risky things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, part of the 
key gameplay, as Desmond mentioned, is these edges and building up advantages for a, a crazy or risky check. And you get to see that visually with how many cards you're stacking up and how many cards your friends and allies are giving you to, for this check. And then you flip them all over um, and see what you get. It's not so much um, a risk and reward mechanic in the game itself, though, because you know that more cards are always going to help you. It's never going to be a hindrance. Uh, the main risk uh, reward mechanic in the game is related to magic, where um, in magic you're encouraged to try and cast bigger, crazy, and spells. But as a result of that, they become more difficult and more dangerous to yourself um, when you do it. Uh, so that's the main risk reward mechanic in the game. Yeah. Um, the other risks are more calculated, like knowing what resources you're giving away and what you have left. Uh, do you break your weapon? Do you break your armor? Do you break your shield? Do you strain yourself? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And speak, speaking of the concept of risk, I did want to ask something about the mechanic known as fate. Mm. Um, yes. Now, so that, will... that is the risk reward mechanic. You're correct. That's 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 the that's the real key part of the game that's related to risk reward. Exactly that. Yeah, go on. Now, what I see what I see out of fate is it is basically is a means for the D, the uh, DM to in, to introduce introduce co introduce complication or, or introduce um, some form of tension within what within uh, what's going on at the table um, mm -hmm. is. Is that a, is that a fair is that a fair approach when it came to the design of um, the fate mechanic? Did, did, are you asking me if that's what it was for? That what it's for? That if that's what you if that's what you were shooting for the idea the idea um, yeah, of um, yeah, ten, yes. of yeah. tension. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I will I will admit as as a minor aside, it in a weird way reminded me of the Doom Pool from um, Cortex. Uh, I. Oh, I think I know it. And yes, yes, there are similar mechanics going around that are definitely inspired by. This is not an original idea on on my behalf. No. <laughs> well, well, look if if you, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen people, it's research. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I did a lot of research going into this game. Believe me. And when it now, when it comes to. When it, come, when it comes to this this particular card based system, in terms of um, in terms of combat, um, wait, should we explain what fate is yeah. to the to the listeners? I guess. Yeah, we yeah we can go we can dip we can dip into that. Jasmine, do you want to? Sure. Um, it's basically like a ticking clock. Mm -hmm. um, you're in a situation that you probably shouldn't stick around in for too long, so. Um, after every round of action that the players do, um, the the game master will take a card and put it in a row. I don't know if it's four or five. It's four, yeah. It's four, okay. Um, and the key is to put it face down. Yeah, it's face down so that the players can see that time is passing, but they don't know what's behind the card. Um, so after four rounds and the GM has collected four cards, um, they'll turn it over one by one. Um, and if the last card, I don't worry about the mechanics exactly. It just, okay. you just turn well, them over and you yeah. turn them over. And if the color at the end is total three or more, then something happens either physical or mental. Um, so this could be like a sudden vision or like an earthquake of something falling down or a blast of fire or something like that. Um, yeah. and we, we did a whole bunch of, well, Darren did a whole bunch of playtesting during MAGFest at the beginning of this year, um, back when we were allowed to be around other people. Um, and it was so, it was a little bit of a sadist. I got, a so I got so much joy out of watching the players squirm as the fake cards were being turned over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really good yeah. for that. Yeah. If if it if it if if it's any if it's any consolation, I firmly believe that every GM has a bit has a bit of a, an inner sadist within them. Yeah, and even yeah, if they don't want to admit. So. It. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Exactly right. so, <laughs> yeah. So the the um the, the the main point behind it is that it gives an excuse for the GM to throw things at the players. Mm -hmm. The GM decides the things beforehand, like. So we, in our intro adventure, we have a burning building that people have to go inside. And the uh, 
complications are related to like the fire getting worse or, or the building shaking or they receive a vision from the other world which is related to what's going on um and then uh the the, the longer the players spend in this burning building, the, the more dangerous things become because they accrue more risk and more chance of getting more complications. So it just encourages people to keep the pace because without this kind of mechanic, it's like, well, what's the problem here? Why do things get worse over time? And it's that it would have to be the GM that forces things on the players. Whereas when you shift it onto the to the the risk and the, the odds of the cards, it kind of puts the blame off the GM and makes everyone accept those complications as, as legitimate because the game's deciding uh, that they're coming about and it's much more fun as well because the players see when the risk is going to be and then everyone gets to join in on the fun of flipping the cards and, and finding out if something terrible happens to them or not um, <laughs> and to the to that end with i there was one there's one analogy with it when it comes to when it comes to fate that i just realized and I, i'm curious if you'd say this applies or not would you say that the fate system is the is this game's version of the bomb under the table, as um Hitchcock pointed out. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um. And 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 one I'll say one more cool thing as well is that the because the players don't know what's going to happen and how it plays out is that some the the GM will describe something that's happened like you hear the fire roar. What do you do? And you have like a split second to respond. The players can maybe guess that oh the fire's going to explode. Or maybe the floor's going to fall out from beneath them. They get a chance to kind of react to it to see if they gain some, some kind of uh, advantage to how they respond. Um, but then later on, you could be in the same scene and the same complication could arise again. And that's not like a bad, that's part of the design. If you then hear the fire roar again another time, then you know what's going to happen and then you can react better to it. Uh, so there's like a, it makes the players can, can feel smarter as well because they can learn um, how the mechanics of the world around them um, are related to the scene that they're in. Um, mm -hmm. They can pick things up. So, uh, yeah. So once you realize there's a bomb under the table, you might realize there's another one later, and that could help you get out of the way in time. Is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to um, when it comes to com when it comes to um, combat, yeah. Now, specific specifically the non magical end of things. Sure. Um, when when it came, was there was there was there a main intention to make to make it so that um, any any um, given pool of actions that could be taken could be put on that one sheet? Because that was something that um, struck me. Oh, the um, like the the conflict sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something um, was inspired by board games. I guess we we wanted to give players something that they can um, uh, look at when they're especially when they're new to the game. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Quick aside, quick tidbit. Maybe about three or three ish years ago, um, Darren was thinking about making this a board game instead of a tabletop role playing game. So there, I think that is a leftover element of it. You know, like making little little characters to put on a playing board, like making a box type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like ha having having handouts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah so but what the like the, 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 the what you've seen is just still a concept like we still need to go once we get the funding from the kickstarter go through graphic designers and make things a, a little bit sexier um mm -hmm. but yeah i definitely because also as well you keep these edges um, that get passed to you so i wanted places where people to keep their cards so they know what they're related to uh you get a card each turn if you have a shield for example that's related to your shield um you get a quick action every turn so you get a card related to your quick action that lets you know if you used your quick action or not um or if you used it to focus on something then you can use the cards you know as an advantage to help you uh so yeah i just wanted to give uh, the players something that to, to help you keep track of things and just to let them remind them of things uh while they're playing if they need that um and i and it, it goes as well with the character sheet i wanted everything to fit on one character sheet i want your inventory to be on there um, I want your attributes to be on there and then your profession schools or your martial abilities or your magic should all fit on one sheet and all the information should be there without you having to write anything down necessarily or look things up while you're playing. Um, that's all, yeah, in definitely intentional. Yep. Now, when it comes to how, when it comes to character advancement, yeah. you, men you mentioned starting out at humble beginnings and then, and then going up from there. And what I, en what I ended up noticing through, through that is this is this sort of um 
I guess I I guess I'll put I guess I'll call it a tr- a trinity of advancement. Um, sure. Between 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 again those humble beginnings to a full on cl- to a full on class to a legendary path and then to a uh, mastery. Yeah. Um, and in a weird way, it kind of reminded me of the whole um, class paragon path epic destiny in D and D fourth edition. The oh edition, right, yes, yeah. the edition that everybody hates, but us in the temple. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, what was what was the um, what was the inspiration for doing that particular separated um, style of advancement? So I'll, I'll let Jasmine say something in a, in a second, but the the main premise, not the main premise premise of the game, but one of the key features of the game is that we said there's humble beginnings. And that was inspired entirely because I was trying to introduce more people to role-playing games and was struggling a lot with a lot of the uh, games that I like on the market um, because you begin as already a hero or an adventurer with all these bells and whistles and abilities and things you have to choose from when you first start the game. Um, And new players are so overwhelmed with that stuff, you have to just tell them, don't worry about it. But they want to know. They want to know what all this stuff does. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had the idea of what if you began the game at level negative three? That was the premise of this game entirely five years ago. It was you begin the game at level negative three. Um, and this is before you're an adventurer. And you're just some person. And then you, you pick up the adventure later on. And then because it's introduced to you gradually, you can anyone can start this game. They just need a deck of cards. They pick a profession for their character. Everyone knows what a blacksmith is or an alchemist or a scribe. Uh, you don't have uh, some people don't know what paladins are, for example. Uh, so it's really new player friendly, um, and so that's where like this beginning profession humble character uh, part of the game started from, um, and then the classes and things uh, came later, which I guess Jasmine you could talk about if you want to. Yeah. So um, as a kid, well, not really kid, from middle school onward, um, I was super into um, an ancient MMO called Ragnarok Online. Um, oh, you too, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and basically, you start off as a novice. Everyone starts off as a novice. Mm-hmm. Um, there really is no differentiating what they're going to end up being like, because um, besides maybe minor tweaks in the stats. But after graduating from novice, you choose one of the like six or so um, base class. And after that, they branch out to specific things like professor or paladin or you know like high priest even further down the line things like that um so i suggested that to darren having sort of like a branching um character progression depending on like the four attributes that you sort of specialize in yeah and and another key part as well is that because i wanted to be new player friendly and about discovery i didn't want you to have to choose your whole path from the as being the first thing you do in the game because you don't know what you want to be you haven't even tried casting magic yet you haven't tried combat how do you know you want to be a fighter a warrior um uh or or a mage um or or whatnot so you begin the game as as nothing and then you get to choose your path as you discover the game itself so everyone gets to try magic and and fighting and combat before they choose their class and then they get to decide oh do i want to be a warrior a reaver a mage or a mystic um and then the legendary path system is also very inspired by uh, Guild Wars um, with like this hybridization of classes. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of um, like multi-classing in the game, essentially. Uh, yeah. Which is always, is always interesting to me because when it, com- when it comes to the class question, you always, mm-hmm. you always end up finding it going down one of two particular routes, either... This is your class, and this is and this is what you're going to be doing. This is what you're going to be doing with. So start swimming, damn it. Or, <laughs> yeah. or you um, or you get or you get um, dr- or you get dropped in dropped into the middle of the o- the middle of the ocean because the game is free form and just told swim, damn it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas uh, in this, like the at the beginning of the game, you have ten choices, which is quite a lot, but they're all things that people recognize, and they're quite minor choices because they're just your profession you're a scribe you're a merchant you're an animal tamer mm-hmm. um you're a crafter or whatever um and then uh, people can pick these up later on as well that's not just a one and done thing you can always pick another profession later on so it's a very um say lo- like low risk decision it's not it feels important at the time but later on you realize that it's not so uh, and then after that, there's only four professions i mean sorry four classes 
which doesn't sound like a lot, but each class has five kind of specialities, like different fighting styles for the warriors and different fighting styles for the reaver, and then different magic schools. Um, so it seems like a small decision, but there's there's a lot of um, a customization available to you. Uh, and then there's the uh, 12 legendary paths, which uh, have their own like awesome unique abilities uh, that you get to pick once you become way more experienced with the game and you know what kind of thing that you want to do. And that's when you get to choose if you want to hybridize and take a multi-class. Um, and so maybe you you, you, you began uh, as uh, taking a warrior's class and you began learning fighting, but you want to do magic as well, uh, then you can become uh, a Primus. Um, uh, for example, and 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 take the mage mage, mage magic schools as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's yeah. So that's exactly right. Is it's the idea of becoming open. So it's more like a branching tree rather than an ocean. Exactly. Now, I know that I know that in the um, in the rules summary, it only showed the uh, first two abilities for several of the several of the uh, schools. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing yeah. that in the in the full book. There's going to be more. There's going to be a bigger checklist for each than just those two. Yeah. So each, uh, they're called schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's magic schools, martial schools, and profession schools. And each school, there's uh, ten for each. So there's ten martial schools, ten magic schools, and ten profession schools. Each school has four abilities, um, and you get access to the first two in like the first half of the game, and then the second half of the game you can access to the second two. Uh, sometimes the second two will be like huge mega enhancements over the first one. So like, for example, uh, in the ele elemental school of magic, there is a spell called Don Element, which allows you to uh, add like fire or earth to your armor or equipment around you to, to help you do certain things. Uh, and then the upgrade of that, which you can get later on, allows you to become like an avatar of that element. So like a, mm -hmm. a flying fire being um, essentially. So uh, they're meant to be like huge inspiring upgrades. But the the real intent of the game is that you have these abilities that are very flexible. The they can be used in different situations to help you with different things, uh, rather than being very narrow. So you might use that um, adorning yourself in fire to make yourself immune to fire, um, or it also makes you run faster as well. For example, um, it make you help you leap across uh, distance things and things like that. So uh, we want things to be very open ended. Um, so give you more choices with the small things you have rather than many choices from many different things you have to look through to, to decide what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the use of spells, um, mm -hmm. would it be fair of me to say that you're that you're aiming for a smaller spell list, but each spell has a lot more um, a lot more variation into how it can be applied? Yeah, that's exactly right. Jasmine, do you want to talk about this a bit? Um. I it's actually okay. don't do spells very much. I only see <laughs> yeah. That's okay. So yeah, that's 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 exactly it. So um, the the best example would be one of the first level spells that a mage can learn is from the psychic uh, magic school, and it is um, telekinesis. And the rules for that is that um, uh, is that you can interact with something as if you were using your hand, um, and that can that's that's the rule. Um, and that allows you to do whatever you can imagine you could do with a hand at a distance. Um, so the, and that also can mean in pushing foes, it's applicable in combat and outside of combat. Um, so yeah, that's definitely intent is having, instead of, I know I was reading through, I don't want to like rag on D and D too much. Um, but I was reading through D and D spell list today and there's like, you get one spell for shooting a fire bolt and then one spell for shooting a fire ball and then one spell for doing a fire wall and then one spell for doing a fire something else. You know what I mean? Um, whereas I, I wanted to have a system where all of those spells are just one spell. In fact, that one spell you can do for moving earth, air, water or fire. And you could decide if it's a fire ball or a fire bolt or a fire wall. It just changes how you're casting the spell and how difficult it is. Mm -hmm. um, so uh yeah that's that's definitely a motivation behind the system and that applies to the profession schools as well and to the martial abilities as well um yep. yeah and the mar the martial abilities is something i'm is something i'm appreciative in this case because i um i've been very critical over the years about fantasy games in ge in general that um give a little bit too much attention to the casting <laughs> side of things yeah um, <laughs> You're if you if you've been on TV tropes, you're probably familiar with the phrase, 
um, linear warriors, quadratic wizards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> actually, we just watched an episode of um, uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender today mm-hmm. about this exact thing. Jasmine, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, we summarize. watched Sokka's Master, mm-hmm. season three, episode four. Um, Sokka, a non-bender, feeling bad about himself, um, not being able to do cool, woo magic. So he goes and trains with the sword master. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to help the Sokka's of the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, look, Sokka is best boy in that, in that whole series. And no one's going to he change is. my mind about that. <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> and He's my favorite. The funny thing about that is the, the, in, in, a, in the case of somebody like Sokka, um, being the comic relief was something that happened by accident. Yeah, <laughs> his his voice actor has a improv background, and so he would add, so he would um ad lib lines just oh, whenever, really? whenever yeah. he whenever he felt appropriate. So they just they just cool. um kept that as part of what uh what his character was. Um, so yeah, I could speak on this a little bit more quickly. In that there's there's like a key balancing part in the game with related to armor. You get mm-hmm. physical armor and you get magical armor. Yep. And obviously one helps you against physical attacks and one helps you against magical attacks. And the key part about casting spells is that um, if you fail to cast a spell, you deal magical damage to yourself. Um, and the bigger the spell you cast, so doing a fireball instead of a firebolt makes the spell more dangerous to yourself. So it encourages um, people that want to focus on spell casting to wear robes and magical equipment that raises their magical armor, but then makes them more vulnerable to physical attacks. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're someone who wants to go into combat uh, obviously you might want to try and take up more physical armor but if you want to be a hybrid um then there's a balancing act there as well because if you're in the middle of combat and you also want to cast spells well that's actually great because now you don't have to make your spells as ranged which makes them easier to cast and less dangerous to cast so you can get away with wearing less magical armor because you're going to be right in front of people and you can just touch them uh which makes the, the spells um uh, less dangerous to yourself um, but yeah, so for the, the, the fighty types, we, we, at the moment it's still something that needs to go through playtesting and that the spells themselves are flexible, uh, and they can help outside of combat. Whereas a lot of the warrior abilities and the reaver abilities, um, are mostly combat focused. So I wanted to make, I want to make sure that if you're taking these martial abilities, you're kind of sacrificing some out of combat utility, but you're going to be more lethal in the fight. But you don't sacrifice all your utility because you still have these profession schools, and they're the main way to uh, influence the world outside of combat. If you're, if you repair your armor or make gadgets because you're a crafter, um, or if you're a healer, or if you're a scribe, that kind of thing. Anyone can do those things. Uh, so if you're a warrior, you can still be a merchant and um, uh, have plenty of utility outside of combat as well. So that's available to everybody. Yeah. Um, when it comes when it comes to professions classes and so on yeah. um is the main thing that that uh oh, is that are there any innate um benefits to pick to picking one or is it mainly um acts or is picking it mainly the granting access to its particular um its particular schools exactly just just granting access at the moment we're still playing with the idea like the idea that perhaps only warriors can charge in combat for example or only uh, reavers can do certain things to do with stealth um that's something that's on the table but at the moment it is just uh, granting you um class uh, granting you access to abilities the legendary pass on the other hand they're entirely unique and give you just one thing that's special to you um so that's where that is yeah mm-hmm. now when it comes now, when it comes to I want to I want to go a bit into the um co- to the concept of lore of lore because mm-hmm. as the w- given the use of sim- given the use of symbols there there are um there, it seems that there are three major um major factions. players ma- yeah, yeah. Ma- major factions within um Avalon. Yeah. The the Valak, the Raxians, and the Fey. Yeah. And what I notice is that each of them has their own unique symbol associated with them. Mm-hmm. And are those symbols going to be reflected throughout the um, throughout the final book? Like if some if something's written from more of a Valak perspective or more of an Imperial perspective, for instance. 
that's a really cool idea that we hadn't thought of. Um, at the moment, the law is going to be written from different perspectives, definitely, and they're going to be signed off as such. Um, but you know what? We hadn't considered that using that for in the, the law as well. I'm going to write that down. There you go. Yeah, you made a contribution. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll put the little symbols next to the, you know, Braxian yeah. tidbits or the the Fey tidbits or whatever. Yeah, you know. I'm going to. We have we have another writer on the team as well as mm -hmm. Jasmine. Jasmine's. Uh, I, I'm a very poor creative writer, so I have to recruit much more creative people than myself to um, make these beautiful prose. And Jasmine's is <laughs> one of them. And we have a. Um, a great guy called Kurt, mm -hmm. um, who is also a writer. So I'm going to write that down and propose that to him as well. And I think he will be on board. So thank you for your contribution, Mildred. That's why we <laughs> like having conversations because many people have many ideas. You can't make one thing by yourself. No. Uh, yeah. Um, I know. I know. I know. There's been the romanticism about the about the Archer style about the Archer style since the 70s, but. That that's the that's the kind of thing that can that kind of auteur approach can only really work in um, film, and even then yeah. it barely works. Um, <laughs> as as and if anybody wants to contest that, I'd say go look go look at the story behind a film called Heaven's Gate, and then and then get back to me on that and how much of a complete <laughs> disaster <laughs> that 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 particular one was, or. The fact that there was so much drama going behind the scenes with Apocalypse Now that it got its own movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, but it was. Now maybe, maybe it's that whole that whole symbol based thing. I I um, I will admit I'm, I can't claim sole ownership of that because the the major thing I was calling back to with that idea was um. One of my fa one of my favorite games over the years, Legend of the Five Rings. Mm, where, yes, our, our writer is a very big fan of that game. Um, where the, where there's a lot of emphasis on the di on the different um, plant symbols and their and the color structures within them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when it when it come but when it comes to those when it comes to those three. Um, factions. Hmm. One thing, one thing, I'm one thing I'm curious about is the is um the is are you are you going to allow op options for some for someone to play as um a representative of all, of one of of any one of the three factions, or is it going to lean a little bit in favor of the Valak? Um. So. The like the intent way of playing the game is that the like the ideal like starting like if I could control how everyone played the game from the beginning this is how it would be mm -hmm. is that you're a humble townsperson from a town in a Valen that is in occupied Raxian territory which are our Roman stands in uh, in mm -hmm. the world um, and so you have no real affiliation to either of any side you really know much about the Fey because you're in like the kind of uh, uh, anti-traditional cultural religious side of the world uh, in in Avalon itself um, you're not an actual member of from from Ataraxia the the, the Araxian empire itself you're born on the land but you're on this uh, reaction side of things so you kind of have no affinity and then it's up to you as players to decide if you want to take a side what side do you take um, yeah. how do you want to change the world but I know that there are people out there who will want to play as uh, Raxian legionnaires that are going through the world, uh, slaying horrific monsters from the other world, the terrorizing towns. You could totally just do that, begin the game at level three and and take that path. Or if you want to be um, Valak warriors that are trying to unite the clans to begin an uprising, uh, then by all means, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't any rules at the moment for playing as Fae, though, per se. They're meant to be alien and otherworldly. Uh, but you can align your souls with them and yeah. uh, try and change things over there as well. So and that's the intent yeah it it mentioned it mentioned about the idea of getting it of getting a title from them and that brings yeah. me to how would the in that regard would the renowned part of the character sheet be akin to social currency in the same way that uh, wealth would be physical currency yes yeah that's the intent um it's um will be allowing you like what kind of people will happily talk to you uh, you could just walk in and say hello to them 
uh, compared to who you might need to like bargain to get an audience with, mm -hmm. um, as well as the kind of people that can follow you around as well. Um, you might have followers that join your party. Um, uh, for example, if none of your, your group is a crafter and you don't want to take the crafting profession, well, if you're renowned high enough, uh, you might be able to convince a young apprentice to follow you around and, and repair your equipment for you. So you don't have to worry about taking uh, that profession, for example. So yeah, that's that's exactly what it's meant to be for, is the social currency and then a physical currency uh, of the wealth and, and your renown, yeah. Yeah. Now, when it comes... Now... When it comes to when it comes to type when it comes to the whole idea of titles, um, mm -hmm. the main one of the one of the big things that always comes to mind for me with that is um, games like at, games like Adventure Conqueror King, where at high levels you're you effectively have your own holding, your own fo your own followers, and and so on. When it comes to the notion of titles, is that something that will um, Scale, that will scale up as you do as you do more things for the um, given factions. Uh, yeah, so we're not at the moment planning to have like uh, like kingdom making mechanics and things like that in the game. Mm -hmm. um, the the main intent intent for it to be is that um, you once you uh, get a title with a particular people, then your name spreads around, and then whether you're in the towns or villages or cities of those places. Uh, they'll have already heard of you and you'll be more welcomed uh, and you won't be a stranger. Um, your your stories will be told by bards across the land um, and it gives you a way to keep something that goes from place to place because word of mouth is hard to spread in, in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we really want to, something we're still working on, but we really want to have a party character sheet, like a character sheet for your party. Mm -hmm. um, this is still in development though, the idea of being... Uh, that it keeps track of the adventures you've been on, the the, peop the relationships your group have with people, um, where your standing is with the different factions, um, and um, yeah, what kind of titles your group has. Uh, that's something we really we're really keen on doing, and related to the wealth and renown mechanics. Uh, but that's something that's still in development. Um, so fingers crossed, something comes from that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, experience is always a interesting teacher, and during during the um. What, were, what would you say were some of the best and some of the and some of the harsher learning experiences once you once you started putting um, Avalon out into the wild and started play te and started going all in on play <laughs> testing? Jasmine, do you want to bring up some stories? Sorry, um, can you repeat the question? Um, experience is experience is always a interesting teacher. So what I'm curious if there's any, if, if there are any instances of things that you were, you thought were surefire winners when you had, when they were written down, but, um, didn't hold up to uh, play testing scrutiny. Uh, well, um, I don't know. The first thing that comes to mind is a particular early, early version of Valen before it was a Celtic setting. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just the setting was very scary and <laughs> none of the players wanted to take any risk none of us wanted to take any risk because we were told the mists were bad and full of scary creatures so we stayed out of the mists and um darren was unable to play test his game because we <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right so this was this was five years ago the first ever play test war would become legends of avalon it still didn't have a setting yet it was set in like a like a borderlands, uh, like a border world where there's like the, the wilderness is the main 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 foe, right? Mm -hmm. And there was so much mystery involved in what was out there, and you were still these humble townsfolk that that was like still part of the game even back then. That the players were too afraid to do anything. Um, they didn't want to leave the main beaten path to go explore the mists. Um, and I I was playing with a group of very adventurous and. And they've played many campaigns before, so it, for some reason that just didn't work. Um, so that's like the first lesson I learned was um, make it happy. <laughs> not just make it happy, but if if you're going to introduce these like darker themes to a setting that, yeah, I guess it's meant to be kind of happy. You're these humble townspeople. It sounds quite uh, joyful and like and and go lucky. Um, so to to introduce those kind of themes subtly, or, subtly, or maybe. Um, gradually, yeah. Gradually, and so that 
that was one of the really appealing sides of the Celtic lore is that the idea of the other world um, and the other world is like this parallel plane of like existence that um, that mirrors ours in some ways. And the key thing about it is sometimes you can slip into it by accident or without realizing, wandering through the forest, you might end up in the other world. Um, and then when you're in the other world, it gives the, the GM, the game master, uh, an excuse to do whatever they want because it's a magical, mystical place. They can make gravity turn off or turn on. They can make time be very funny or space be funny. Mm. Uh, they can invent creatures and, and, and as they like. So it's like once you're in the other world, then you know, oh, here, there's a place of mystery and magic and anything can happen and the GM can have fun with it. But then when you're not there, then you're in the real world. And so having that like divide um, uh, was something that I learned early on from these early playtests was um, keep your mystery and craziness in a, in a particular place that people know when when they're there and when they're not. And they can uh, and also the idea that you can slip into it by accident, that really um, that helped as well from that first playtest. Yeah. Um, as for game rules, um, uh, try to think of something that really didn't work. Uh, I feel like the points system that we used to have kind of fell flat. What the health points and energy points and things like that. Yeah, energy points and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that I, I think I just started because I started from other games that I played. I had these health points, and then I wanted to try energy points because I wanted the magic and the health to have um, different resources, which ended up in the game slightly with the different physical armor and magical armor. Uh, that's the direct source of that but I, I i soon realized playing the game that i one of my least favorite things about games is is hitting something over and over again until the number becomes zero um that's one of my least favorite things about combat in in other games um and then that's what led me to this uh like tier system with three strikes you're out uh, and every time you hit a strike something changes about the way the game is played or about your character because uh, now you're tired you can't take risks as much anymore um or if now your arm is broken, now any attack might hurt you. So you, you might want to retreat. Um, and then you become wounded and that's bad. So, And the same thing happens to your enemies. Like if you're fighting against a dragon, for example, uh, you can break their wing and now they can't fly. Uh, you can take out the, like the glands beneath their neck so they can't breathe fire anymore. Uh, you need a tough guy to take off the scales so then the archer can, can uh, aim into their flesh. Um, so, yeah, so that there was like, yeah, definitely some things at the beginning when we first started playing that really, now looking back, shaped really strongly uh, where the game ended up being from from these failures. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, the uh, now the Kickstarter is is um, you got three at the time of this recording. It's um, it's on its it's on its final set of days. There's three days to go. You were asking for, you had it set at um eight thousand pounds, and you're currently at. 18.4 thousand which congrat congratulations on smashing that um thank you <laughs> now once all the extra paperwork after the kickstarter um wraps up um mm -hmm. what what are you shooting for as far as a release window are you thinking um early 2021 yeah we're planning for april next year all right and i'm get. And um, what would you say the page count is that you're shooting for? Are you shooting for um, 150? No, now with the uh, stretch goals, we're going for 200, 250. It should be around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um. And when it and of and item and um, I know that there was also the art book that was advertised. How many pages yeah. do you see that um going at? Oh, I, that I'm actually genuinely not sure about. I think around 100 um that's going to be something that evolves over time but around 100 i mean there's going to be at least 50 to 70 illustrations in the book so yeah around 100 um mm -hmm. yeah and i'll def i'll definitely be looking forward to that although um looking at looking at the looking at the about us part of the kickstarter jasmine i do have to ask one question yes what's up with that picture <laughs> it is Believe me, it is a picture of me, except I cropped myself out. <laughs> um, I took a selfie with a deer when I was when I went to Nara with my parents a long time ago. Um, but then I decided the deer looked way cuter than I did. So I've been using that um, picture of the deer as my Twitter icon. 
Great. Now, ev now everybody thinks I've been talking to a deer for the last hour. <laughs> I'm a deer. <laughs> um, which, given, give, although given the fact that so, given the fact that some people, for whatever reason, think I'm a frost giant, I am. Um, I'm not one to talk. <laughs> That's um, fair. <laughs> also, what, what one thing, bringing it back for a second to the art mm -hmm. book, why aren't other RPGs doing this? Like, people love the art in RPGs. And I've, we, we, me and Jasmine collect art books for video games. And we just, we just, I just thought one day, why don't we do an art book for our game? Do other games do this? And as far as I can tell, it's not really a thing yet in the RPG world, but I, I feel like it should be. I want to see it's, more art books. I get, I get the feeling it has, I get the feeling it has to do with, um, the fact that a lot of, a lot of, um, people who do game design aren't necessarily mm. artists. Or, yeah. or the fact that the pe a lot of people who do role playing games aren't necessarily artists, although um, that's that's one that I um, I'm not a hundred percent confident on because you got you got to do dungeon maps and the, and the like on the fly anyways, and mm. people and people have to scour the internet for 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 stock art or inspirational art anyways, so mm. it's it's. It is one of those things. That's a good. That's a good point. I get. I guess in a lot of com in a lot of companies' cases, it's a cost issue. Um, yeah. Because I don't. I think I've only seen a small handful of games do it. Um, yeah. Shadowrun did it. Oh really? Cool. Um, Exalted did it. Which, if Exalted didn't do it, then I would have cried bloody murder about that. <laughs> um, and this, and more specifically, Exalted Second Edition did it. I don't know if they intend to do it with Third Edition, and yeah. um, I am, um, I'm not putting so, out high hopes on that. And D and D's done it, I think, three times. Right. Um, so once for me, it was just, it was just, I was getting all this concept art from the artists that mm -hmm. end up becoming the final pieces, and it just seems so strange for the people that are into the game not to see. The, the sketches as well because that stuff looks just as cool as the final version i i, I mean and at least to me anyway I'd, I'd imagine that within that art book there's probably some excerpts from the artists yes yeah exactly ab ab about yeah. the motivation not motivation but for the motivation for the piece as well yeah exactly yeah um part of the reason i part of the reason i mentioned that is i do since you mentioned avatar i will note that i have the art book for yeah the last airbender and yeah. um, throughout <laughs> that there's there's little stories or the or the reason why they went with certain designs um exactly it was through that that i found out that the cabbage merchant was a bit of an homage <laughs> to cowboy bebop of all things really oh my god <laughs> we have the album but we haven't read it for so long That's yeah, so cool. yeah he, they meant they um specifically mentioned the three old guys that always show that always show up in cowboy bebop that was the inspiration for the cabbage merchant that's amazing <laughs> um or the whole thing with Aang having that ridiculous amount of ar armor, that was them intentionally lampooning Nickelodeon's yes. marketing department. <laughs> it, would not, it would not be the first time because Julie yes. is, was, it was um, outright admitted as being, in, as being inspired by Nickelodeon's representative. That's <laughs> uh, amazing. <laughs> that's great as well. We need Which, to read that book again, Jasmine. Yeah. <laughs> The only, it up. <laughs> look, the only bad thing I have to say about that book is that the forward is written by Shyamalan. Oh, oh, yeah. oh really? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> That's tragic. What do you mean? Shyamalan is not involved with the Avatar universe in any yeah. way. <laughs> at all. Yeah, yeah, I know where you're going with that. <laughs> look, I, look, consider yourself fortunate that you didn't have to sit through the, sit through that damn movie. I did. Oh, I because so I drew, because I have awful luck with drawing straws. Oh no! And I guess I can take some solace in the fact that that and that that film ended up winning a Razzie. But um, oof, yeah. Um, it's it's gonna, and the, that's why um, when I found when I found out what happened with with Netflix's attempts to yeah. bring it to oh. live action, I. I just I just laughed because I because I realized this is, a this is gonna, franchise. <laughs> um I th I think tr I th I really I really think that there sh I really think that there should be some sort of mandate at this point that you need to you need to get express written permission in triplicate in order to try and do a live action adaptation because 
How many yeah. live action adaptations of something animated can you name in the last 20 years that were actually good? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna try. This has become a, a really sad Avatar <laughs> fan burned out therapy session. <laughs> um, <laughs> so true. Oh, read the books though. The books are great. The um, the Kyoshi books. the Kyoshi yeah. books that they've come out recently. They're they're good. Yeah, those, like those. I feel like I feel like those are a nice um are a nice yeah. redemption for for things that yeah. happened beforehand. Yeah, like, um, but yeah, you're right. It's not live action. <laughs> look, uh, I um. It's just, it's, it's just, for for me, the, for me, this idea that you, that animation needs to do needs to be done in live action in order to be interesting is um a slap in the face as somebody who loves animation so much, to the yeah. point where I get angry when somebody calls animation a genre. Yeah, it's a medium. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but what, but. Even even with that, it, it it is funny that you mentioned um you mentioned Guild Wars earlier as one of your inspirations because yeah when it comes to a lot of the character art I can definitely and some of the environment art I can definitely see that it is carrying that kind of heavily inspired by yeah for lack of a better I, for lack of a better term um watercolor uh, mo yes, motif yes with yeah some, that's with exactly what art. I wanted yeah I uh, I went to the artist and, and pointed to Guild Wars concept art and said this is what I want. Um, do this but but normal people please <laughs> um guild, yeah. guild wars 2 especially with yeah. has that has yeah. that particular style one a little less so one's a little bit more normal ish yeah i can't i can't go with that <laughs> look i never i never claimed to be i never claimed to be a master of my own vocabulary <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no you're exactly right that's that's entirely where the inspiration came from mm -hmm. uh, i have a love for that game's art style um, and um, also, it, it helps budgetary reasons wise as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was just a, yeah, it's exactly what I wanted. And then I actually scoured the Deviant Art and Art Station for artists that came close to the art style in their own work already. So I selected artists for that style in particular, mm -hmm. uh, found hundreds of artists and narrowed it down to 20 to 50 that were had pieces that were similar to that style um and then spoke to everyone and asked them about their availability and their schedules and ended up with the um the ones that we have now um exactly because they have they they were keen on that kind of style as well themselves mm -hmm. um so yeah that's what it's about yeah yeah now with all, with all that said i'll definitely be looking forward to um how to how the book is going to how the book is going to turn out um and I do, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell that is time zones to come <laughs> onto the show. No, we're fine. Um, it's only nine thirty here. We're good. <laughs> um, look, I look, I um, I have a the most charitable way for me to put it is I have a love hate relationship with time zones as a whole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible idea. Yeah. And. To the to the point where there was there were several points in time where I was considering moving to the UK just so just so I could make things slightly easier, but then I realized, well, knowing my luck, if I do that, then I'm going to interview somebody from Australia or something. And I'm going to be back when oh, I yeah. started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did Gen Con online a few um, a month ago now, and that was I had some like sessions going till three o'clock in the morning, and that was really tiring. Uh, so yeah, I understand this global world we live in. But it makes it everything more accessible as well. So it's you know pros and cons. Yeah, um, the 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 only time it's a con is what is when I is when I run out of whiskey. Because <laughs> <laughs> that either either run out of whiskey run or run out of any, run out of any sort of drink mm -hmm. because um, well, I like to follow the tradition of the Trappists. You know the monks who brewed their own beer. Right. <laughs> oh. That's only because everybody keeps saying you're a monk. You shouldn't be allowed to drink. Um, no, 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 friend. <laughs> what the hell else are you going? What the hell else are you going to do in a monastery? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but any again, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. It is encouraged. It is encouraged. Uh -huh. 
And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! Cheers, thank you!